Information Policy Census and National Archives Subcommittee will come to order. And uh, let me welcome you to today's hearing entitled Census 2010, Assessing the Bureau's Strategy for Reducing the Undercount of Hard-to-Count Populations. Uh, this hearing is a follow-up uh, to the subcommittee's July 2008 hearing on the 2010 Census Integrated Communications Campaign. Uh, we have with us today invited distinguished colleagues who have asked to uh, participate uh, in this hearing, and they will be here shortly. Uh, and I will ask unanimous consent that they be allowed to participate. Thank you. And uh, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member uh, who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And I will begin with an opening statement. The uh, purpose of today's hearing is to examine the Census Bureau's strategies uh, for two aspects of the integrated communications campaign. One, the partnership program and paid advertising. Uh, we seek answers to, uh, to the questions of one, how will the communications plan decrease the undercount and increase the male response rate of hard to count communities. And two, uh, whether the campaign messaging will generate community support for the census. Uh, we will also look at funding for the 2010 census including the $1 billion allocated in the stimulus bill. A Census Day 2010 is nearly one year away. Yet, as we learned in our hearing on March 5th, there is still much work to be done uh, by the Bureau to put its operation plans uh, in place. The Regional Partnership Program could be very helpful in ensuring that everyone is counted. The program is credited with attributing uh, to the success of the 2000 census. According to a report of the GAO, um, key census taking activities such as recruiting temporary census workers and encouraging people to complete their questionnaire would have been less successful had it not been for the Bureau's aggressive partnership efforts. The paid advertising program could also play a key role in reducing the undercount, uh, as it did in 2000. The Bureau has plans to use national and local media to get the word out about the census and encourage participation. Uh, media buyers uh, should seek to reach diverse markets in the most effective and cost-efficient manner possible. Uh, we will find out today uh, how the Bureau plans to accomplish this goal. Uh, I thank all of our witnesses, I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward uh, to their testimonies. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Watson for joining us today, and uh, I want to uh, go to my friend and the ranking minority member, uh, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. I know you just got here. Or I'm a little winded, it. yes. I, I can imagine. Uh, uh, take your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for testifying today. Uh, Chairman Clay and I certainly have the, the same goal, which is to make sure that this is the best census in our nation's history, the most accurate census in our nation's history. And an important uh, function of that would be to reduce the undercount for this census. And the Census Bureau, uh, Bureau's regional partnership program and advertising plan are part of an integral um, 
communications campaign uh, aimed at reducing the 2010 undercount, reaching hard to count communities and achieving a full count decennial census. Reaching these communities is not only important but also required by the United States Constitution. A full count census and actual enumeration is specifically and firmly rooted in Article I of our Constitution. The economic stimulus bill included $1 billion in additional funding for the Census Bureau with at least $250 million of that uh, amount specifically designated by Congress for the partnership program and outreach to traditionally hard to count communities. The partnership program for the uh, 2000 census involved more than 140,000 organizations and for uh, 2010, the Bureau has already partnered with over 10,000 organizations and hired over 800 partnership staff. In order for such a large endeavor to succeed, rigorous oversight and transparency of funds and of participants uh, is vitally important. In hiring temporary enumerators, the Census Bureau has testified that it will conduct thorough FBI background checks that include fingerprinting. I think that's good reassurance for the public that when a, an enumerator comes to visit them, that they can open the door and it's a law-abiding citizen on the other side. We must make sure that the Bureau has comparable measures in place to hold organizations participating in the partnership program and their employees equally accountable for their actions. Furthermore, the Bureau should have clear guidelines and standards for the selection of partner organizations. It's important to ensure that contractors are awarded through a competitive process and not simply doled out, money doled out, to anyone who applies, as well as monitor how and where money is spent by participating organizations. Accountability and the spending of these funds is obviously essential. Today's hearing presents an opportunity for the Bureau to, the Bureau to describe the quality control measures in place to implement, uh, to fully implement this plan and in their hiring of all field workers and enumerators and the field work process in general. As I've stated before, Chairman Clay and I uh, share the, the goal of ensuring that every individual in America will be counted once, only once, and where they live on Census Day 2010. A transparent, accountable partnership program and a, a strong advertising campaign are fundamental to achieving it. Uh, I also uh, recognize that uh, the list of uh, folks testifying today is um, not as full and complete as, as we had hoped um, in terms of uh, uh, our request that the head of the partnership program testify about the roles that they're fulfilling. Uh, we had hoped to hear directly from the individual that's overseeing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of our taxpayer dollars. and. Uh, we believe is, is essential to making sure that we uh, reduce the undercount and reach hard to reach communities. Uh, it, I think it's unfortunate that uh, we don't have the division head testifying today. Um, and uh, I think we'll have many specific questions that uh, Mr. Metzenberg uh, that we'll need to get specific answers from. And the reason why we wanted the, the division head to testify is so that we can get those specific questions. Uh, we certainly respect uh, uh, you, we certainly respect uh, the duties you, you fulfill, but we also want to make sure that we get specific answers so that we can have uh, the proper policies in place and the funding in place to reduce this undercount. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, I'll, I'll now go to Ms. Watson if you have an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I think uh, holding today's hearing uh, is very, very important uh, as we examine the Census Bureau strategy for reducing the undercount of traditionally hard to count populations in the 2010 Census. I look forward to hearing about the challenges and the goals shaping the Bureau's integrated communications campaign to promote the Census, improve participation, and decrease the differential undercount. Since the establishment of the decennial census in 1790, every census has experienced an undercount. And particularly in my district, certain areas run double-digit undercount. According to the Government Accountability Office, the 2000 census missed an estimated 2% of the U.S. population, a disproportionate number of which were minorities, lower-income households, and children. 
My district in particular has traditionally been undercounted due to a lack of engagement with local constituencies. This undercount is troubling because without accurate population data, it's important to ensure that the Americans have proper representation in state and federal government and that federal grants are targeted to where they are needed the most. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 authorized $501.5 billion worth of new spending measures to revitalize the American economy while assisting those most impacted by the recession. This unprecedented investment in our future makes the need for the 2010 Census to be as thorough and accurate as possible even greater, as the success of the stimulus relies upon complete population data to ensure funds are directed efficiently and equitably. The Census Bureau's integrated communications campaign reduce the undercount rate for the 2000 census uh, relative to 1990, and according to the GAO, appears to be a comprehensive and to be integrated. Success now depends on the ability of the Bureau to move effectively from the planning to the operational phase while incorporating best practices and lessons learned from the 2000 uh, census to translate increased public awareness into actual participation. Participation, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, thank all of the panelists who've come here today for their cooperation with today's proceedings. And I look forward to hearing more details about the partnership program and the target media strategy of the integrated communications campaign as we monitor efforts to reduce the undercount in the 2010 census. Thank you so much, and I yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson, for that opening statement. Now I want to go to Mr. Chaffetz of uh, Utah. You recognize for opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you calling this hearing. Uh, it's, it's important with the discharge, discharge of the constitutional duty and conducting the census uh, that we all be vigilant in the expenditure of dollars and the time and effort and the call upon the American people to participate willingly in helping us to make sure that we do not undercount uh, the population of the United States of America, nor do we overcount it. So I appreciate the witnesses who are willing uh, to come here today and participate in this hearing. I, I thank them. I also want to make sure as we, as we move forward and we discuss uh, the issues that affect the census that we also deal with the American people's uh, money in, an, in a transparent and accountable way. There are significant dollars that will be flowing out the door, and I want to make sure that we have uh, safeguards in place to monitor the expenditure of those dollars and that the American people have the, the uh, uh, ability to understand where and how those dollars are spent. I also have some questions and concerns about how and who we would partner in order to execute this so that we have the faith of the American people that it's being done in a transparent way that they have the safety and security, that knowing that their vital information is dealt with appropriately. Um, and I do have some questions that I appreciate you addressing uh, regarding the partnership program specifically. Again, I thank you for being here uh, uh, today and thank the chairman for calling this hearing. Thank you. Yield thank back you my time. so much. Thank you for your statement. Uh, let me now introduce our panel. and We will hear from uh, first from Mr. Thomas Messenborg. Uh, Acting Director of the United States Census Bureau, and thank you for being here. Our next witness will be Mr. Robert Goldenkopf, uh, Director of Strategic Issues uh, at the GAO. Uh, Mr. Goldenkopf's responsibilities include directing work on the 2010 Census. Good to see you again. Uh, and our third wit witness will be Mr. Jeff uh, Tarkasian, uh, Executive Vice President of Draft FCB the prime contractor of the two, on the 2010 uh, Census Integrated Communications Campaign. So good to see you again, Jeff. And our final witness will be Ms. Stacy Cumberbatch, the City Census Coordinator for the City of New York. Uh, Ms. Cumberbatch is responsible for managing the execution of census operations in the city. Uh, let me welcome you, Ms. Cumberbatch, and all of you 
uh, to our hearing today. Uh, it is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Uh, would all, all of you please stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you uh, solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I, I do. do. I do. And thank you. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Uh, the yellow light will indicate that it is time to sum up. The red light uh, will indicate that your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Messenborg, well, you may begin with your opening statement. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with an update on the Census Bureau's 2010 Integrated Communications Program. Our 2010 goal is to count everyone, no matter how difficult or challenging that task may be. An insightful, engaging, and effective communications campaign is an essential component of a successful census. The 2010 Communications Program is multifaceted, employing and integrating paid advertising, public relations, a very robust partnership program, and a census and schools component. The campaign uses multimedia to reach people by television, radio, magazine, newspapers, outdoor and commuter media, and the internet, and through trusted voices in the local communities. The 2010 communications campaign is data-driven using detailed track level on mailback response rates from Census 2000 and updated household characteristics to identify the hard to count segments of our population within media markets and local communities. This information will help provide the right message in the right media in the appropriate language at the right time. The hard to count track level information was used to segment the population into eight relatively homogeneous groups or clusters. Five of the clusters represent hard to count populations and they will be targeted during every phase of the communication campaign. Decisions related to budget allocations and media buys use the hard to count scores. The advertising campaign includes a national and a local component. With the addition of $100 million in stimulus funding for advertising, our preliminary estimate allocates $63 million for the national campaign. The national campaign is designed to reach all persons who consume media in English, regardless of race or ethnicity. $82 million will be spent on local advertising, and that is directed at the harder to count populations. The local targeted advertising delivers messages in local, ethnic media, in language, and in culture. The Census and Schools program will be national in scope with an emphasis on hard to count populations. This program encourages students to tell their parents about the importance of the census. The program provides every school with teaching guides, lesson plans, maps, brochures, and take home materials in English and in Spanish. Now while paid advertising can educate, inform, and motivate households and individuals, Census 2000 demonstrated that Census Bureau partners at the national and local levels serve as powerful and trusted advocates that can effectively reach segments of the population not persuaded by advertising. Partnerships will be integrated with all other communication channels, including advertising, broadcast and print media, internet initiatives, and the Census in Schools program, with the aim of creating positive messages about the 2010 Census in hard-to-count communities. Staff in the Census Bureau's 12 regional census centers began work with key stakeholders in mid-2008 when 120 partnership staff were mobilized to engage local and state governments, tribal leaders, faith-based and community-based organizations to support the census through the establishment of complete count committees 
an effective and proven initiative. We now have 680 local partnership specialists hard at work recruiting trusted local leaders who will use their influence and networks to motivate their communities to fully participate in the 2010 Census. Uh, currently, more than 13,000 organizations have made commitments to partner with the U.S. Census Bureau. Stimulus funding will permit us to add an ad additional 2,000 partnership staff. Partnership staff, like all of our field staff, will be hired locally. They know the neighborhood, the challenges, and the trusted voices in the community. Mobilizing a larger and better trained cadre of partnership staff and partners will help us meet the challenges of counting an increasingly diverse population. Mr. Chairman, our integrated communication campaign is well positioned to educate, inform, motivate, and mobilize our nation's households to participate in the 2010 Census. A complete and accurate 2010 Census is our highest priority and we are determined to produce a census count that fairly represents everyone in our nation. Thank you. Mr. Messenburg, and I will go to Mr. Goldenkopf now. Uh, you may proceed with your statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to provide a progress report on the Census Bureau's integrated communications campaign. The campaign is a critical component of the census because it's aimed at boosting participation, especially among traditionally hard to count groups. Funding for the communications campaign received a substantial boost under the recently enacted American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Among other things, the act provided up to $250 million in additional funding for outreach efforts to hard to count populations. This is a 61% increase over the $410 million the Bureau had originally budgeted for its communications effort. As requested, my remarks this morning focus on the status of the campaign's key components, including partnerships with governmental and other organizations, paid advertising and public relations, and census in schools, a program designed to reach parents and guardians through their school-aged children. In reviewing these components, this much is clear. If implemented as planned, the communications campaign will help position the Bureau to address the undercount. However, most of the activities we examined are in the planning or early implementation stages and considerable work lies ahead. Future success will depend in part on how well the Bureau incorporates lessons learned and best practices from the 2000 Census and takes other steps to enhance performance and accountability. Importantly, the communications campaign is focused on hard to count populations. As one example, draft FCB, the contractor responsible for orchestrating the campaign, worked with the Bureau to segment the population into distinct clusters using data from the 2000 census that are correlated with a person's likelihood to respond. Each cluster was given a hard to count score, and the Bureau's communications efforts are to be targeted to those uh, clusters with the highest scores. With respect to the campaign specific components, the Bureau's partnership program is set to expand with additional funding under the Recovery Act. The Bureau had initially planned to hire 680 partnership staff for the 2010 Census and achieved that level earlier this year. However, funding from the Recovery Act will enable the Bureau to hire around 2,000 additional partnership staff over the next few months. By comparison, the Bureau employed around 600 partnership staff for the 2000 Census. Now, on the one hand, the higher staffing levels will enable the Bureau to better support local partnership efforts. On the other hand, it will be important for the Bureau to have the appropriate management infrastructure in place to hire, train, deploy, and supervise these additional personnel. Further, given the current state of the economy, the partner's ability to support the census is unclear. State and local governments, as well as community organizations, may not have the budget, staff, or time to aggressively promote the census. With respect to paid advertising, the Bureau plans to use numerous media sources, including digital media, to reach a diverse audience. Further, the Bureau has completed market research to gain an understanding of people's feelings about the census and the factors that inspire or hinder participation. 
The Census and Schools program is also moving forward under a contract with Scholastic Publishing. The Bureau plans to spend around $11 million on this effort in 2010, uh, compared to $17 million in 2000. The Bureau believes the reduced funding levels will not significantly affect the program because it plans to leverage materials developed in 2000. It also plans to better target its efforts and make more of the materials available electronically through the Bureau's website rather than through printed copies. However, as with the partnership program, the extent to which schools have the resources to disseminate this, this material is unclear, and it will be important that the schools do not perceive the Bureau's approach as a financial burden. In summary, the Bureau's communications campaign appears to be comprehensive and integrated. Further, the Bureau appears to be addressing some of the factors that will be important for success, including incorporating lessons learned from 2000 and targeting resources to hard-to-count populations. Nevertheless, while the communications campaign has made some important steps forward, considerable work lies ahead in getting all of the key components fully operational. Further, while the funding from the Recovery Act could help expand the Bureau's outreach and promotion efforts, less clear is the extent to which these additional funds will improve response behavior or which component of the campaign will yield the best results. So therefore, in moving forward, it will be important for the Bureau to develop a spending plan for the additional funding it receives under the Recovery Act, identifying, among other things, cost estimates of the activities to be funded, the objectives and outcome-related goals of the plan spending, and how the spending will help achieve those goals. Chairman Clay and Mr. McHenry, members of the subcommittee, this concludes my remarks, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Golden Call. Uh, Mr. Tarkasian, is, yeah, um, you're up for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. McHenry, members of the subcommittee, draft FCB. Would you move that, the microphone closer to you? Okay. Draft FCB and our subcontractor partners, thank you for the opportunity today to talk to you about the integrated communications campaign for the 2010 census. Joining me today are colleagues from Draft FCB and our subcontractor partners, Global Hue, DXposito, and Global Hue Latino. Since we spoke to you last on July 2, 2008, we remain on track to deliver the communications campaign to the marketplace in January 2010. Our work, our work continues to be on budget, and we have made considerable progress. Let me give you a few highlights of that progress. First, the plan for the integrated communications campaign was completed on July 15th and accepted by the Bureau in September of 2008. We began field work for the Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators study called CBAMS in July and reported on its findings in the fall of 2008. This study has proven very, very effective uh, to messaging development and to media planning, particularly in understanding the attitudes and behaviors of the hard to count. From a creative and messaging development standpoint, Draft FCB and our partners developed creative concepts during the November and December of last year for all audiences. We produced rough versions of approximately 114 concepts. We then traveled across the country gaining feedback in language and in culture from the audiences that will see these messages. In total, we spoke to approximately 1,400 people in 21 cities in the 48 contiguous states, Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia, representing all races and ethnicities. In April, we'll be presenting a final report of the findings to the Bureau, and we plan to begin production of the advertising in June. From a media standpoint, Draft FCB and our partners developed media plans for all audiences earlier this year. Currently, we are issuing RFPs uh, to media companies. We are also beginning to replan incorporating incremental dollars from the stimulus funding. These plans will be presented to the Bureau in April, while the timing of the upfront buy is very market driven, we expect it to conclude at the latest in August 2009, which is the first phase of our buying, and a second buying phase for local media will occur in fall of 2009. With regard to the partnership program, we provide promotional items and materials to support it. 
Um, we have developed materials and items, both ourselves and our partners, that have started arriving in regional offices in March and will continue through November. Materials consist of either action or awareness messaging. They will be available in 19 languages. All of them will be available electronically and many printed as well. With regard to public relations, we have been supporting the activity of the Bureau's PIO office with initiatives including weekly media monitoring, media training, the development of media lists, and logistics for the partner kickoff meeting later this month. For census in schools, the Bureau accepted the plan uh, in January. Um, we have uh, begun implementation with the mailing of an announcement letter to principals. As far as the contract overall is concerned, we are on track to reach our very aggressive goal of 40% of the contract spending to small business. Most of these opportunities will occur in fiscal year 09 and fiscal year 10 in connection with the local and national media buys. In summary, at the risk of stating the obvious, the planning and implementation of the campaign is an enormous effort. We fully recognize its importance and urgency. There's only one chance to do this right. So we're grateful to the encouragement, input, and advice of stakeholders and oversight. We are fully committed to making the campaign's decisions research and fact-based, as well as sensitive to the counsel of those whose insight and experience will help improve our efforts. So we proactively have incorporated as many opportunities in the campaign's development as possible to gain that insight. Today we look forward to your observations and advice, as well as any questions you may have about this extraordinary effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tarkasia. Uh, we will now go to our final witness, Ms. Cumberbatch. Uh, you have five minutes to make a presentation. Uh, good morning, Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today about the City of New York's plans to ensure a full and accurate count of our population. My name is Stacy Cumberbatch. I was appointed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg to serve as, as the City of New York Census 2010 Coordinator. I have over 20 years of experience in public service, philanthropy, and the law. The City of New York is the most populous and ethnically diverse city in the United States, with a population of 8.36 million people as of July 2008. Over 3 million of New York City's residents are foreign-born, about one-fifth of whom arrived since 2000. New York City has the largest Chinese population of any city outside of Asia. More people of West Indian ancestry live in New York than any city outside of the West Indies. Over 2.27 million Hispanics live in New York City, more than any other city in the United States. Non-Hispanic New Yorkers of African descent numbered 1.95 million in 2006 more than double the count of any other city in the U.S. More than 200 languages are spoken with almost one half of all New Yorkers speaking a language other than English at home. New York City's diversity is its strength, but it also poses a challenge to ensuring that every New Yorker is counted in the 2010 Census. Recognizing this, Mayor Bloomberg established the City Census Coordinator Office to act as a primary liaison with the Census Bureau, leverage city resources and relationships to promote the 2010 Census, and supplement the outreach activities and communication strategies of the Regional Census Office. In a large and diverse city like New York, the partnership program is critical. However, there are many questions we have about the partnership program. How does the Census Bureau determine how many partnership specialists are assigned to New York City and how they are allocated across the city? How does the Bureau evaluate the work of individual partnership specialists as their outreach work proceeds so that gaps and inefficiencies in their strategies are identified and fixed before the enumeration? What is the process to determine ethnic media buys in local markets? And how is the communication plan coordinated with the work of the partnership program? The Census Bureau needs to adopt a more formal process of convening diverse local stakeholders together, engaging them early in the development of a comprehensive local outreach and communication plan so that local expertise and resources are included and considered. Again, I want to emphasize there must be an ongoing interactive feedback process as plans are implemented so that local and Census Bureau resources can be deployed efficiently and problems can be fixed as they arise. While the city's population exceeded 8 million for the first time in 2000, the overall response rate to the mail-in questionnaire was 55 percent, much lower than the average national response rate of 66 percent. 
A further analysis conducted by the city's uh, Department of Planning reveals that certain neighborhoods have a high concentration of low response rates tracks below 40%. These same neighborhoods had low response rates in 1990 census, and in some areas, response rates actually got worse in 2000. One of our challenges over the next year is to penetrate these particular neighborhoods to reverse this historical low census response rate. These neighborhoods are largely African American and Afro Caribbean. The New York City 2010 Census Office will make a concerted effort in collaboration with the Regional Census Office. Uh, to work with a broad cross-section of leaders who can make the case in these communities of why it's important to be counted and participate in the census. The Census City Coordinator's Office is also working with over 20 city government agencies to develop plans to promote the 2010 census through existing agency communication networks and activities. For example, the New York City Housing Authority, which manages the city's public housing stock and Section 8 program, has assigned a staff person to my office to develop and implement outreach plans to reach 633,000 residents, one in 13 New Yorkers who receive uh, housing assistance from the Housing Authority. We have already held two briefing sessions with over 100 resident leaders explaining the 2010 census and providing them with information and data to focus their outreach efforts. This is an example of what is required to heighten public awareness, build trust, and encourage people to participate in the census by filling out the questionnaire. Public housing resident leaders got it right away about the importance. Uh, they were aghast to find out that certain developments had uh, response rates as low as 31 percent. Now, what is key here is follow through on everyone's part to continue to carry the message. In conclusion, while the census is a federal responsibility, there must be early and ongoing communication and accountability to local governments and communities given the impact of the census on apportionment, districting, and federal funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps we can get some of your questions answered today. Uh, we will um, start with uh, Mr. Massenburg. Let me let me ask you about um, GAO has pointed out that a long-standing challenge facing the Census Bureau's marketing efforts uh, is converting awareness of the census into an actual response. Uh, how do you plan to address this issue for 2010? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we see the integrated communication plan as our vehicle for uh, converting hard to count populations into mail back respondents. And it'll, uh, it'll approach this problem on several fronts. Uh, first of all, both our advertising and our partnership program and our census and schools program all will focus on the hard to count population. So that's job one, to improve the male response uh, rate in the hard to count populations. The advertising will do that by providing the right message in the right language and the right media to those groups. But we understand that awareness and information is not enough. And that's why we're excited about the partnership program being expanded, thanks to the Recovery Act funding, uh, to provide about 2,800 people that will be in the field providing uh, logistical support, reaching out to a broader group of partnership, uh, possible partners, and to uh, provide the kind of follow through that we sometimes lacked in 2000. Uh, so we see it as a very integrated program, get the message out, the information out through the advertising, follow through in the local areas, primarily through trusted voices in that community. Uh, the level of effectiveness of partnerships as they proceed uh, so that gaps in their plans can be identified and addressed by local entities. Will there be a real partnership between the Bureau and local communities? That certainly is the uh, aim, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we've got a couple of things in place that I think that are going to really assist uh, on that. One is a, a tool we're calling our Integrated Partnership Contact Database. Uh, this is new. 
every time we partner with an organization, we will actually uh, enter, uh, enter information on the organization, the characteristics of the group they represent, uh, the number of members and affiliates that the group may have. Uh, whether they actually target uh, a, sp uh, a special ethnic audience, whether they're a business, an educational kind of facility, and such. Uh, that'll also lay out the kind of commitments that the organization has made uh, in terms of supporting the census. That might encompass things as uh, putting promotional materials. It may involve establishing a complete count committee it will have uh, specific actions in that that we will then be tracking. But I think in terms of uh, how effective we are, that's a responsibility of the uh, regional directors and the regional staff, because after all, we think the census is really a local phenomenon. Uh, but it will be also closely monitored by our uh, field division office of partnerships and I can assure you it's going to be closely followed by the director, myself, and our associate directors for decennial and field operations. The real proof in the pudding is what will happen with male response rates and differential undercount. And that's something that we will be uh, focusing on uh, once we start data collection. But until that point, we're really going to be tracking very carefully uh, the number of complete count committees we have established. Last time we had 11,800. The goal for this census is to exceed that number. We have a goal of establishing uh, 30,000 uh, questionnaire assistance centers, and we have a goal of establishing 40,000 be counted, and we'll be tracking how we're doing on reaching those goals. Thank you. Mr. Tarkasian, uh, what new information was learned from the um census barriers, attitudes, and motivators survey that did not previously exist? The CBAM study uh, was designed to give us a measure of what holds people back from responding and what are the things that we can use to motivate them to respond. We had through the audience segmentation that the Bureau had done where the hard-to-count populations live. Uh, we took that and we appended to it um, with a, a industry standard uh, research source called Simmons, the media habits of the hard-to-count and the rest of the population. So what CBAMS gave us was sort of the missing bit of information, which is why people respond or why they don't respond and what's necessary to get them to respond. Some specific examples of how it helped us. We were able to segment the population into five mindsets. And we learned, for example, in one of those mindsets, uh, which we call the head nodders, it's a group of people who are very, very impressionable to messages in the media. They may go into the census being predisposed to respond, but we know that they, their predisposition should change. So it's helped us because we're able to put more frequency against that particular target group in our media efforts than we might have if we hadn't had that bit of information. Uh, there are other groups where we've learned that privacy and security uh, is not only a critical message, but that in conjunction with the work that we've done in copy testing has helped us to better craft that message so we understand precisely what the right thing is to say. Okay. So okay. those are let two me, examples. Let me stop you right there. Now, you take a look at the map on the wall behind you. Uh, did you find anything different in your study from what we have found in the map? You know, and this came from the Census Bureau, that data. The, the, the map tells us where people reside. It tells us um, their location geographically, so therefore we can target our media and target our spending to them. It doesn't tell us why they do what they do. And the CBAM study is all about the why, uh, so that we're able to then craft the media uh, in terms of how we plan the media, what kinds of frequencies we use, what kinds of vehicles we may choose, 
as well as craft the message more precisely. That's really the value of this study. And when you surveyed cities around the country, uh, did you get any indication of why suburban areas and urban areas vary so widely? I'm not sure whether it, it, it's so much that it's somebody lives in the suburbs versus somebody lives in the city as, a, as the reason why it, it varies. It has to do with uh, things related to people's lifestyle, people's family situations, uh, it, it is really the, the sort of first reasons why somebody might or might not respond. For example, one of the factors that's a critical factor is renting versus home ownership. Uh, linguistic isolation versus being uh, fluent in English is, is another uh, critical factor. Wait a um, minute, now renters versus homeowners, they both get mail. They both get the response form. So what's the difference? C could you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Uh, you, you said that one of the reasons were renters versus homeowners. I mean, if you're looking at suburban versus urban. So, I mean, both both uh, renters and homeowners receive mail on a daily basis, mostly. So what's the, diff what's the problem there? One, one difference between renting and home ownership is that when you own a home, you make a longer term philosophically commitment to being in that particular location. If you're a renter, you might only be making a six month commitment, uh, a year long commitment, you don't have the sense of ties to the community that you might, and therefore you may see responding to the census as being not quite so relevant and not quite so important to you uh, at, at, versus being a homeowner. And your, your study cost how much? The study in total was a little over $1.4 million. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chaffin, I recognize you for question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding is, and after the 2000 uh, uh, census, the GAO found that the Bureau had, in its uh, report back, the GAO had found that the Bureau had no clear guidelines or criteria for selecting organizations in which it would partner for the census. And my question, Mr. Messenberg, in the absence of Mr. Olson, we're disappointed that he chose uh, not to be here. Um, in order to become a partner with the census, is there anything that would preclude somebody from being, is there any, criteria by which they cannot become a partner with the census? Okay, let me, uh, let me start with what our criteria are. Uh, so we're looking for uh, organizations that possibly had uh, uh, past, in the past participated. They actually know uh, what I, this- I'm just interested in what would exclude somebody from being a partner. Any, uh, anything that would be an embarrassment to the census and prove ineffective to actually getting the heart how do you, of the how count do you, how to how enumerate. Do you how do you define what an embarrassment is? That past behavior? No, it would probably be more in uh, current behavior. I'm not quite clear what you're asking, Congressman. I mean, there are, there are certainly certain organizations that we are not going to partner with. But the uh, question is, how do you determine which ones are and which ones aren't? Well, uh, as we look at the partnership program, we look at it about the same way as we look at the census, that it should be inclusive. So we start with the assumption that if an organization has good reach in the hard to count areas, then we'll be willing to partner with them. But is there any criteria by which you would exclude somebody from partnering? If they had criminal backgrounds, if they, if they had members that had, is there no written criteria? We have the, the written criteria that I uh, was articulating. First, what's the reach into uh, the hard to count areas? Do they have some, uh, do they have respect? Will they be listened to in those organizations? Do they have the kind of organization that will permit them uh, to be viewed as a trusted voice? So I think the trust of the organization in the local community will be a key criteria. Well, I guess that's the question is, how do we define who's trustworthy? 
who would be, as, and to use your words, an embarrassment, how, how, where is that line is what I'm trying to get at. We don't have a hard line. I'd say where we're, we start with the proposition that we should be inclusive. And if an organization demonstrates that uh, they are not going to be a strong supporter to the census, then uh, that would give us pause for continuing the partnership. At this point, of course, we're very early in forging these partnerships. And what most organizations do, they may agree to do proclamations, provide on-site recruiting and training sites and those you, sorts of things. You can understand and appreciate there are some organizations out there that would draw uh, criticism from some and praise from others. So how, th there is no hard line. That based on the 2000 census and the recommendation from the GAO, they're, given all those years, there's actually no written guideline that say we would exclude these people. I we mean, if they were involved in uh, corruption, voter fraud, anything like that, is that, would that not exclude somebody from participating? And that would give us pause for consideration whether we should partner. If there was proof that they had uh, had that they had done that sort of behavior, as an individual or as an organization or both. Well, typically we're, I mean, always we're partnering with the organization, not with a specific individual within the organization. Okay, so you would look at the actions of the individuals within that organization to help make that determination as to whether or not no. they had a pattern of. Misbehavior? We, we would not have the capability of doing that. In Census 2000, we partner with over 140,000 organizations. It is just not practical or feasible to uh, track uh, every individual's performance within that, or should that be the business of the Census Bureau, I believe. Uh, if the organization has the respect of people in the local community and can help us count the hard to count people, then we would partner with them. And if they them. don't re have the respect, then, you, then by the same criteria you would say we would exclude if, them from partners. Yes. Okay. We're looking for partners to be trusted voices within the local community well, if what they're about, not. What about political organizations? Is that an acceptable, if, if that group is a political organization, would that be an acceptable criteria by which they could be, participate as a partner? We partnered in Census 2000. We formed 11,800 complete count committees. Those committees were formed by the highest elected official in the town, the city, the state. So in that sense, we, uh, we certainly have a long record of partnering with political uh, organizations, state and local governments, tribal government. Um. How many census workers will the part, will uh, partners be supplying to the bureau overall? Would you guess? The uh, partners will not be providing any uh, persons to work on the census. They will be providing their expertise, uh, their resources to help us promote our message. They will not be involved in census taking or census activities directly at all. Um, what are the specific penalties for an enumerator committing fraud? Do you? Uh, five years imprisonment and or $250,000 fine. Based on the last census, how many people actually uh, were convicted of such a, a uh, penalty? I don't have that figure on the top of my head, but I can get it for you, Congressman. And, and my, I, what, uh, what is the uh, legal authority or who has jurisdiction to actually go back and uh, pursue somebody that you may believe as an enumerator may be fraudulent, is that is it the FBI? Who, who pursues those? That illegal? would be the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. U.S. Attorney's Office, okay. Um, and what mechanism do you have in place to actually, once they reach that threshold, to actually engage the U.S. Attorney's Office? We have detailed quality assurance steps in place that, uh, for example, during the um, non-response follow-up operation, we'll do a re-interview process. And that, permits, uh, that would permit us to identify systematic uh, fraud being conducted by an enumerator, and that would be the, uh, that would uh, engender legal action being taken against them. And Mr. Chairman, I, th I thank you for allowing me to go over my time. Let me just uh, say in conclusion that it's very disappointing 
to know that there is no written guideline as to who would qualify and, and not qualify. I know what you're looking for. You want to get as many bodies and many organizations involved as possible. But I find it totally unacceptable and scary, quite frankly, that we don't have criteria by which we can all agree that partnerships would either, uh, partners would either meet a certain threshold or not meet a certain threshold. I would hope that at your earliest convenience, you would get back to this committee, and me specifically, with details as to who qualifies and who doesn't. Because there are some organizations on that list that, quite frankly, many of us are very concerned about. While certain segments of the population may think there's no problem, I happen to be one that think there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm very disappointed that, given the uh, GAO report that came after 2000, that there was no follow-up and there is no written guideline. And uh, I think we should all be very concerned about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome for that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Watson, you recognize. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. According to the March 20th Washington Post article, the current economic crisis may threaten the 2010 census efforts to get a full and accurate count. The increase in home foreclosures and the rising jobless rate means that Americans are indeed leaving their homes, all the while increased financial hardships may make some Americans less willing to cooperate with census workers. Now, uh, and this is for anyone on the panel that might want to respond. Are there any specific plans in the integrated communication campaign which reflects this new reality? And do you foresee the economic <coughs> crisis adding to the undercount rate of hard to count populations? And let me just say, I'm looking up here at some handouts and you probably have a copy of them. And I'm really troubled because uh, the areas that are, uh, we get the less response and the undercount are the areas that have been hit hardest by foreclosures. So anyone on the panel, well, let's just go down the line. All right, uh, let me start. Um, let me just reiterate that our, uh, our entire communication strategy is focusing on the hard to count populations and these maps are actually uh, reflect the data that we're using in terms of where to devote resources both from an advertising perspective but also from uh, our local partnership program. Uh, as we, and, and I think we need, uh, well, let me start again. The partnership program is really our voice into the local community. And we're looking at the hard to count areas and that's where we're going to be placing additional partnership staff. What we need are folks in the local community to tell us uh, and inform us on what some of the special problems that we may be encountering, whether they're tent cities or increasing uh, foreclosure rates. Um, that will help us shape the message and it also help us form questionnaire assistance, assistance centers in those areas so we can reach out to that group and assist them on first, reassuring them that it's safe to, and confidential to fill out the data, and second, we provide a, a, a location they can come to to actually fill that out. Anybody else want to add to that? I would echo um, some of that. The, the partnership program is key to getting down at the, the grassroots level, convincing people that um, it's okay to respond to the census, overcoming any of their, their barriers that they have, um, their fears that they have to respond to the census, whether it's uh, concerns about confidentiality or privacy or how the information will be used. The questionnaire assistance centers, uh, be counted campaigns will also be part of that as well. Um, and it's uh, what the Census Bureau has, and this is a good thing, it's a series of backstopping operations where if the Census Bureau misses you in one operation, they'll try and get you in another operation, and they have several of, of these safety nets. But I do want to point out, though, with the, with the um, Census Bureau's use of numbers here, I think they use 30,000 questionnaire assistance centers and 40,000 be counted locations. Now, all of those questionnaire assistance centers will be 
be counted location. So the, the total is not 70,000. It's actually there will be 30,000 questionnaire assistance centers and 10,000 additional be counted locations. So that number is, is not as, as big as, as uh, was made by the, the Census Bureau. Uh, let me just uh, expand my inquiry here. Uh, in California, we have one particular town that's a ghost town, almost completely in foreclosure. How we, you send something to that address, people are no longer there. How are we going to track to be able to find where this population has disappeared too, so they can be counted? They're no longer in that town. So uh, one response, if we would, if if that community uh, would have participated in our local update of census addresses that was done about a year ago then we may have some intelligence about that and those changes would have been reflected in our uh, our census mail list uh, if if they haven't been then when we go out to the field or hopefully before we go out to the field in conversations with those local communities people will tell them tell us and inform us that this is a real problem issue. Uh, and then we can take appropriate uh, action. As, uh, as my colleague from uh, GAO was mentioning, we have various ways that we can enumerate. One is mailing a census form out and hoping it comes back. Another is actually to send an enumerator to an address and try to collect that data. Uh, right away. So they're no longer in Dodge. Yep. If they're no longer there, uh, it would be useful for us to, to know that at the beginning of the census process because our normal procedure would be, oh, I'm sorry, would be to mail out a census report form. Then we wouldn't get any re, uh, response back. We'd send another replacement form possibly out there. And then eventually at the beginning of May, we would send an enumerator. And we will visit six times to, uh, to make sure that no one's actually there. So the sooner that we could identify that was a problem, the better off we would be. Uh, let me, my time is almost up, but uh, let me just say this. I hope that uh, if you prepare standards, you base it on now and not in the past, because we do want criminals exactly. who are back in the population counted. Mm -hmm. We want every individual, they exist, they exist somewhere, and this means resources to the community where they exist. So I don't think criminal records have anything to do with it, and you need to, I always suggest, and I call in the regional director where I'm located in mm -hmm. Los Angeles to talk about how they can count people. Mm -hmm. And we want people maybe like kind to go in, exactly. and uh, with particularly some of our ethnic communities. If somebody comes in looking like a process server, believe me, the population disappears. But if they come in looking like a member of the community, uh, they're more trusted. Uh, we have this problem with apartments because uh, they'll put two people down when there really are 12 people yes. residing in there, you know, hiding out. So I do hope that you will take into consideration what we need now, the undercount, and how we solve that problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the extra time. Thank you, Ms. Watson, for the, those pointed questions. I appreciate it. And now, Mr. McHenry, you recognize for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, Mr. Metzenborg, uh, the original notice from the committee uh, was a request to testify uh, by Mr. Tony Farthing, uh, New York Regional Director of the Census Bureau, and Mr. Tim Olson, Assistant Division Chief of Partnership for the Field Division of the Census Bureau, uh, the subject matter of this hearing today. However, as we all can see, they're not seated next to you. Uh, there are two empty chairs. Are they present here today? Oh, no, they're not, Congressman. Okay. Um, I think it's disrespectful for the committee for you to simply say no, they cannot testify. Uh, can you tell me why they're not testifying today? Did it might not meet with their schedule? Well, actually, it's been, um, it's been our past practice that uh, either the, uh, well, typically that the director or the acting director will testify. 
where we needed the expertise. We certainly have had associate directors testify. Uh, I think it's been rare indeed where we've had uh, uh, grade 15 office chiefs testify. Um, I believe that uh, I have to be uh, knowledgeable about what's going on in the organization, and I feel comfortable uh, about our partnership program, where we are and uh, where we need to be. Uh, the other thing that we have been doing is we've been doing uh, a series of briefings on the Hill. We've been bringing in our regional directors and we've bring, been bringing in the appropriate staff uh, for those staff briefings. Well, I, I'd certainly want a, a full briefing uh, and I do think it's important uh, I mean, based on this precedent, so the director, the acting director, is the representative of the, of the bureau around the city and before Congress? Mm -hmm. that the acting director, I'm sorry, Congressman. Uh, I believe, yes, I am representing the Census Bureau. But that's your tradition, is that you yes. represent the bureau around it. It's interesting because I just read a story about a, a forum at Brookings, and yet a division head represent the bureau. Uh, there. That's uh, right. Frank Vetrano represented the uh, Bureau up until uh, about a week ago. We had no presence at that uh, forum. So we called the organizers and asked to send someone. Actually, they asked for uh, Frank to sit on the panel that discussed the census. So it's okay for division heads to, to speak around town, but they can't come before Congress? Well, they, uh, I wouldn't uh, agree to it just seems to ridiculous that. to me is what I'm saying. We've got an individual who's going to be spending hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars that we actually want tech, uh, technical answers for to make sure that we minimize the undercount and they can't testify. So I'm going to have some specific questions. You'll probably sure. end up having to uh, talk to Mr. Olson and, and have written uh, answers for it. I understand. Okay, and it's good. not to say that uh, you're running a big organization. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar organization, there, therefore we're just trying to get the division knowledge uh, and make sure that we have a, a strong baseline of understanding of where we can help. Uh, that's what it's all about. Okay. It's, it's, you know, certainly. Now, was that deci decision made by you to, to not allow them to testify? It was made by the Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce. Mm -hmm. Who is the head of the Department of Commerce currently? Uh, who, would, who made that decision? Uh, the senior advisor to the secretary, along with the communication staff. Down well, there is no secretary. There's an acting secretary. No, uh, I'm saying the staff, uh, the senior staff assistant to the secretary to be. Well, the secretary to be uh, wasn't sworn in when this decision was made. You're, the, the answer was no last week. And there was no Commerce Secretary. Uh, he, would, he was testifying before a, com a committee in the Senate last week. Now, the senior political official at the Commerce Department made the decision. I didn't mean to say that uh, Secretary Designate Locke made the decision. All right. Well, so uh, no White House? There was no White House involvement in this? No. Okay. All right. Well, let's actually get to some substance here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Frank Vetrano, uh, before Brookings uh, last week, said that uh, statistical sampling, quote, quote, is not in our current plans, end quote. Um, is that? That's true. That is true. Now, is that, um, uh, can you elaborate on that? It's not the current plans. Are there uh, potential plans for sampling? No, statistical adjustment has not been in our planning all during the decade as we prepared for the 2010 census. Okay. Um, it, does the, the way he words his answer, it's not in our current plans. I mean, uh, it, wouldn't you just say it's not in our plans? It's not in our plans, yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, to, to go to uh, s some other elements here, um, Mr. Goldenkoff. Uh, certainly appreciate uh, your report uh, on the communications efforts. Um, it's certainly helpful to, to, to get uh, some, some outside assessment of the effectiveness or, and, and some historical reference here. 
um, in figure one of, of your of your report, okay. you talk about the undercounts and overcounts between 1990 and the 2000 <coughs> census. Just bear with me for one, one second. I have a Okay. And figure one, uh, there are a number of different metrics of um, race and ethnicity uh, of undercounts or overcounts. And in figure one, there is uh, a section, American Indian slash Alaska Native on Reservations. There is a 12.22% um, uh, undercount uh, in 1990 and a 0.88% overcounts in 2000. Um, can you speak to that? Why there was such a, an enormous shift? And the, what was done to, to create that massive change? The switch. The, the, the Bureau recognized that uh, following the 1990 census, the American uh, Indians were uh, had the most error. They were the largest undercounted group, I believe, of, of all the different um, the, the entire pop population, that particular segment, had um, among the highest, if not the highest, undercount. And so the Bureau put forth a tremendous effort through its partnership program, the Tribal Liaison Program, uh, to do a better job counting American Indians. Could, could you perhaps put together something and, and explain exactly what was done? Because it seems like it's a great example of the Bureau's well, success in, in uh, reducing the undercount. Actually, created an overcount. Sure. Well, sure. What, what we did, and we saw some of this, uh, we were out on the Menominee Tribe in, in Wisconsin, um, and what the Census Bureau did, among other things, they had a very active census in schools program on, on the tribes. They had partners who actually came from the tribes, and significantly they came from the, the tribes that they were partnering with, um, and it gets back to the trusted voices, um, again, that convinced um, American <laughs> Indians to respond. There was a, a paid media campaign that was specifically focused on um, reservations and American Indians. Um, there were posters specifically focused and were culturally sensitive to American Indians. And, and just one little um, tidbit from that um, to, to show how the Census Bureau is concerned about cultural sensitivity, uh, there was an advertisement, I believe, where it showed uh, a younger person, I think it was a little boy, um, seated um, in, in front of an elder, and that apparently was disrespectful, and so the Bureau made an effort then to, to change it, to make it you know, culturally sensitive, and so mm -hmm. the Bureau was culturally aware. So it was really a combination of all these, these different factors, um, communications, as I mentioned, and also going out to the reservations and making sure they had accurate address lists. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goldenkopf, uh, the the committee has learned of plans to spend an additional $1 million uh, of the stimulus funds to conduct more research. Uh, in your view, would it be wise to spend these funds to conduct more research or to spend this funding, as Congress intended, on outreach to traditionally hard-to-count communities? Certainly that's where the Bureau has had the most difficulty with in the past is on the, the hard to count. It's not a matter of getting everybody to, to, well, you know, folks that are already going to participate, it would not be a wise use of taxpayer money. Um, so the Bureau needs to focus on where it traditionally has the most difficulty getting people to participate. In terms of how that money should be allocated, I mean, we, we certainly support the fact that it should go, that it, the resources should be targeted. But in terms of how the money should be allocated across the different components, we have not seen any data to drive those particular decisions, whether money should be invested in paid advertising versus more money for partnership specialists versus more money for um, uh, local funding, local um, uh, to provide money for, for supplies and things. We have not seen any data to drive those decisions. So. Um is data forthcoming, or is, um, is, is this just done um, internally? Is the Bureau directing the, the, uh, their, their partners in the, uh, uh, I guess, draft I FCB? Would, okay. Mr. Messenborg, tell me how these decisions are made. We looked at, uh, as our biggest challenge, improving the count 
of the hard to count populations. And uh, two ways of doing that was advertising, uh, and almost all of the additional stimulus funding is going to go into local, uh, local media buys, where we really. Excuse me, how okay. much is the total budget for communications campaign? I'm sorry, how much is How the, much is your total budget oh, the for The total for the communications contract is now $312 million. That includes the advertising, the purchase media, the uh, public relations support, the census in schools program. For our local and regional partnership program, we're going to invest about $280 million in that program. And that's going to be primarily support for the 2,800 plus partnership specialists and assistants we'll have in the field. And if I could just clarify my remarks, I mean, what, yeah. what the Bureau has is very good data down at the, the track level of where these hard to count communities are. But what we haven't seen is good data on where the Bureau gets the biggest bang for the buck in terms of the return on investment for these, these different components of its um, uh, communications campaign. And we'll make a determination of uh, how we get the best bang for the buck before. Uh, I'm sorry? Will you make a determination beforehand or? or? I'll land. I can. Uh, I can uh, supplement a little bit my previous answer. So what we, one of the important lessons that we learned in Census 2000, and we did th th this through research that was conducted while we were in the field collecting data, was that actually the household composition and the characteristics of that household were key predictors of census mailback rate. Before, in, 90, in the 1990 census and going into the 2000 census, the conventional wisdom was that civic community participation was an excellent predictor of census mailback response sure. rate. What we found from this study was that was not the case. So the, uh, the household types with the highest response rate were what you might think of as your traditional family, uh, mother, father, and children. The next highest male back response rate was um, husband and wife with no children, and so on. The, uh, the group that had the lowest male response rate actually were households that were headed by a single, single head of player. household and had children. And then what we did is take the hard to track uh, male response rates, but also uh, supplement that with the characteristics of the households in those tracks. And that's where we found things like renters have a lower male response rate than people that actually own their house. So I think this has been all very effective in helping us shape the message for 2010. And I feel that the whole communication campaign this time is much more data driven than it has been in the past. But to answer where we make the decisions, we saw that we didn't think we were investing enough in the local ethnically oriented advertising. We're going to increase that. Uh, but if the advertising doesn't work, if we don't have those partnership people in the field mobilizing the local community at May of 2010 is too late to start doing that now. Okay. So that's so, part of our decision. So there will be a extra or, or emphasis put on uh, uh, head of household, single head of household? No, actually the, uh, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes, so th that, <laughs> All right. th okay. that, that is okay, one no. of the five hard to, uh, <laughs> and what it helps us, Chairman Clay, is tailor that message to that group. And, okay. and that's what we're All trying right. to do. Thank you. Let me let me go to Ms. Cumberbatch uh, to kind of break this up for a minute. <laughs> your, uh, Ms. Cumberbatch, your office provided a map to the committee that will be used to help uh, guide your efforts. Uh, in your testimony, you said African American and Afro-Caribbean neighborhoods with low response rates in 1990 remain low in the 2000 census and some actually got worse. That's correct. 
Uh, what are your theories about the continued low response rate in those neighborhoods? Well, clearly, whatever messaging and communication plan that was implemented in 2000 was not effective in reaching those communities because based on results, um, those neighborhoods in New York City, and it's pretty consistent, it's basically the lowest response rate tracks in New York City are throughout the five boroughs of New York City, all are in African American and Afro Caribbean communities. Uh, Central Harlem, Central Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, which I want to add is actually a home owning community uh, with the uh, largest, the highest median income in New York City. So based on uh, some of what I heard today about renters being low responders, uh, the reality of New York City is a little different because Southeast Queens is a home owning community, as well as the Northwest Bronx which is largely an African-American, Afro-Caribbean, and African community with uh, large home ownership. So those two communities in New York City, in fact, Southeast Queens, the response rates were lower between 90 and 2000. They got worse. Um, so obviously there has to be some concerted effort in New York City on those particular uh, neighborhoods. In your uh, view, what can the Bureau do to maximize census participation in these traditionally hard to count? Well, from the perspective of New York City, um, I think we, the regional office uh, for New York City actually covers New York City, it covers Long Island, it co covers northern New Jersey, it covers a population of about 20 million people in that whole region, New York City being 8.3 million, um, and for that whole region there are something like 60 partners that have been hired to cover not just New York City, but to cover the region clearly just based on the population of New York City and the diversity of New York City that I outlined in terms of ethnic diversity, language diversity, uh, if we are going to penetrate these different communities with partners, clearly there has to be more partners uh, on the local level. Um, and those partners have to be, obviously from those communities, have to have a lay of the land of what organizations are effective communicators. And But one of the things that needs to happen is it has to be a comprehensive plan at the local level. So bringing in all the local stakeholders, local government, local leaders to say, okay, he here's what the response rate was in 2000. Here's our challenge ahead. How are we going to map out a strategy using the uh, communication strategy, you know, leveraging what, what the Census Bureau is going to do, but on the local level, what is the plan of action? And right now, I don't see that type of plan being uh, implemented in any of the region. In our region, I don't know if that's a requirement, but it seems that if you're going to have a strategy that's comprehensive to bring in all the resources, you need to convene all the stakeholders and lay out that plan. Are, are you also part of a the state of New York's full count committee? No, no actually, no. I'm just for New York City. Just New York City. Right. Okay, thank you. Ms. Watson, you may. Yeah, I just want to follow up, Mr. Chairman, with your questioning, too. Uh, Mrs. Cumberbatch, uh, I'm looking at the map uh, I think that you probably are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And we can see that in a community, as opposed to, say, Harlem, in a community where most of these are homeowners, uh, middle class, maybe even uh, upper middle class, mm -hmm. and uh, taxpayers, and so on, they have the worst rate. Right. Now, who is responsible for laying out a plan and evaluating to see if the figures, if the data is any better than what it was when you took the last census? Uh, I am really concerned when I see a map like this, and these are mostly minorities, and you see that the count was really more effective and more reliable up in Harlem than it is down here. So who's responsible for planning out the strategy and evaluating it? Would it be you or would it be uh, Mr. Messenbaum? <laughs> well, uh, clearly it's the U.S. Census Bureau because it's a federal responsibility to do the census. And as a local government and as taxpayers, they are accountable to local government as well as all taxpayers on what that plan is, how detailed it is, and how does it really address something that has been a historic undercount and low response rate. That map was put together by the city's planning department so that we would have a guideline to, to make our efforts in terms of the city's efforts, and we based it on response rates. So we didn't use the hard-to-count criteria, which 
actually, if we had used it, might have excluded Southeast Queens because it's a homeowning community. Yet the response rate shows that it's a low responding community. Mr. Messima, would you address? Certainly. Um, the, um, there are multiple dimensions we're attacking uh, by segmenting the population. So certainly I didn't mean to indicate that only one of the eight clusters was a problem. Actually, five of the eight we would characterize as hard to count populations. Uh, a, a couple points on the uh, Afro-Caribbean. In 2000, we did not do any advertising that sp specifically spoke to that audience, and that is part of the campaign for 2010, so that ought to help. Uh, the other thing we're doing is significantly expanding our partnership presence uh, in New York. And um, as was said, we have about, uh, fi well, actually we have 57 partnership specialists right now in the New York regional office. With the additional stimulus funding, we're going to bring in another 161 partnership staff to work on that office. So we'll have about 218 people. So we will have more than tripled it. And we think that's going to be a key initiative to get the message out to those local communities. And then uh, the evaluation to see if your planning has been more effective uh, in this decade. Okay, I can, uh, I can talk to that. Uh, we're going to be doing real-time assessment of the partnership program in terms of how many commitments we have with partners, how are we doing in terms of establishing complete count committees or uh, questionnaire assistance centers or sites to do recruiting and training. And uh, we'll be tracking those specific commitments. We also uh, will be doing an evaluation within local areas because we're going to have all of this information documented in a, in a database. And then at the end of the process, we're going to do a systematic evaluation program. Actually, the National Opinion and Research Center is going to do an evaluation study, which will uh, assess the and evaluate the effectiveness of both advertising, partnership, and the Census in Schools program. Thank you. Uh, what's troubling to me as I look at this map of the greater New York area is that places where African Americans live have the lowest and uh, count, or the greatest uh, undercount, and that's very troubling. And as I look at that map of the United States, mm -hmm. you can almost read through it and see where you have your minority populations, you get a tremendous undercount. So I would hope in this decade that uh, we would really concentrate on trying to get a more accurate account. And in saying that, there are some who feel like uh, we need to take the census out from underneath the Commerce Bureau and have it as an independent agency where you could really, really uh, operate independently and not be competitive with other huge issues that come under commerce. What is your thought on that. Uh, as a career official, I have no opinion on, <laughs> on that. We'll keep plugging along doing this census as well as we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And uh, I recognize Mr. McHenry for question. That was uh, quite a dance. <laughs> uh, actually, Mr. Mesborg, now I don't want to, you know, beat a dead horse here, but what individual? It, was it the top political person within the Census Bureau that said no to uh, no, your division it, heads testifying? It or was, was it the top political person at Commerce? I wasn't sure. It was the uh, top political appointee at this point, at the well, a week ago at the Commerce Department. Okay. And, and who is that? Just uh, Rick Wade. Okay. But okay. I will say I supported his decision on that also. I don't want to put it all on him. Well, certainly you probably requested the answer from him. I, I certainly understand uh, being in an uh, acting position. Yes. Um, okay. Well, 
Let's go through a series of questions here about the partnership program. There's $250 million of the funds for the Bureau and the stimulus package uh, that were specifically designated by Congress for outreach programs. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, can, you tell, can you tell us exactly how these, uh, uh, these groups the Bureau is partnering with um, are going to spend the $250 million? Can you just give some broad overview? Okay. Uh, in terms of the stimulus uh, money, in terms of outreach, we're going to spend an additional $100 million on advertising, public relations, and the census in schools program. Okay. Almost all of that money is going to go towards, most of that money is going to go towards paid advertising. And uh, of the additional money we're investing, 80% is going to go into local uh, media targeting the hard to enumerate. Of uh, the, uh, the additional $120 million that we're going to invest in the partnership program, uh, the vast majority of that money is going to go into paying people. So we're going to hire an additional 277 partnership specialists on mm -hmm. top of the 680 we have. So we'll be uh, close to over 900. And then we're going to hire 1,750 partnership assistants. This is the first time, the first census that we will actually have these partnership assistants, and they'll permit us to extend our reach out in the local communities and also to provide the kind of follow-up that we weren't as strong as we should have been in Census 2000. Okay. Are the funds given to partners awarded competitively uh, through a bidding process or expended through grants? No, uh, no funds to speak of are provided directly to the partners. The partners can put in a proposal, uh, say, to run some sort of promotion, to, uh, to ask us to provide a banner promoting the 2010 census. We will actually do that procurement ourselves. They'll put in a proposal. We will review the proposal and then uh, we will actually contract to have the poster uh, printed and delivered. There's a limit in terms of what we can do on the transactions. Uh, any, any kind of good uh, can be, has to be under $3,000 in any service under $2,500. And, and those things would be given basically in kind. You would provide materials, advertise, that true. type of thing. So are, are checks written to partnership groups? No, the partnership group will put in a proposal, let's say, to do a series. So no money's exchanged. No money is exchanged. We Materials and things of that sort would be. Yeah. Okay. We, we, will, uh, we will do all of the acquisitions associated with that, and we will track and monitor okay. uh, the disbursement now, of funds. Uh, one of the GAO's recommendations uh, was to document and audit in-kind contributions to the partnership programs. Um, is, is that been implemented? Do you have a program to implement that? Yes. Every, every in-kind payment we made, we'll have a, we have a disbursement log and a process that will track all of those. Okay. Um, and uh, what, what are this? Uh, well, you, you described the standard products that, that you'd be given in-kind, in uh, and it's more of advertising, basic advertising materials. Is that Typically Correct. promotional materials to support the uh, census. Okay. Um, and uh, so you have a mechanism to ensure that taxpayer dollars will be, there'll be an audit trail, there'll be a trail to, to follow the disbursement of products and goods. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, will there, there be a metric to determine the effectiveness of, of these funds? Um, and I know it's difficult in the process to determine whether or not this banner is effective, but for 2020, will we, we, will we be able to look back and say that, you know, these dollars were spent effectively or we should do more of this rather than that? Is, is there a metric to determine effectiveness? There's, there's not a direct metric to do this, but I suppose I should put this in some context. In total, we'll probably be expending something like about $18 million on these kind of initiatives, and that's out of about almost uh, $270 million. You said $8 million? $18 million. 18. Out, out of a total of about 270 
uh, million. Uh, I think the real assessment for the uh, for 2010 of the, with the partnership program is going to be: Did we improve the uh, the re mail back response rates in these hard to count areas? Okay. Um, now, determining this effectiveness, Mr. Goldenkopf, um, you know, have you judged or ha have you done any analysis on the metrics to judge the effectiveness of these, of the, the, those partnership funds? Our concern is that the Bureau has not done a good job of that, that the Bureau has not developed outcome measures. Um, many of the measures are more input measures, number of partnerships, for example, number of agreements, um, and that's certainly a, a concern of ours. Um, other things, I mean, certainly response rate is one thing that, that can be looked at. Um, cost and progress milestones, um, is the Bureau, are, deliver, are milestones being met, are delivery dates being met, satisfaction of partners. That's another outcome measure that, that can be looked at. We haven't done any intense research into this, and these are just more options for the Bureau's consideration, but our concern is that the Bureau doesn't seem to be there yet. Are there written guidelines uh, for participation as partners? Criteria for making decisions? Yes. Um, no, as, as Mr. Messenberg said, there was, there was some general guidelines on who the Bureau should be participating with outreach into the community, that, that sort of thing. But again, our concern is that um, there's no criteria that is fully documented, transparent, clearly defined, and consistently applied. The issue here is that you have, a, if you use data from the, the, the 2000 census, there are 140,000 partnership agreements. The Census Bureau gives a lot of latitude to its regional offices and then down the partnership specialists making those decisions. A lot of these people are temporary employees. They don't have the big picture view, so it may appear to make sense at a very local level, um, may be inconsistent with the goals and values of the Census Bureau. So it would certainly be helpful for making these decisions to have something that was much more clearly defined, certainly, of not only who the Bureau can partner with, but who they shouldn't partner with. And it's not just, you know, obvious decisions, people, you know, organizations with, <laughs> might be corrupt or law enforcement organizations um, probably would not make a good partner for the Census Bureau because it could raise concerns among, you know, certain communities that they're uh, using this, this data. Certainly. So, Certainly. And that might not be apparent when, they're, when it, it's so decentralized like that. Uh, Mr. Metzenborg, do you have, you know, I, th this is not new what Mr. Goldenkopf is saying. He's has certainly been written and shared with you. Do you yeah. have some I elements we, to address this? We will commit to, uh, to being more transparent in terms of what our criteria are going to be. We'll actually put them to, uh, to paper. But I, I think it is. Um, is it currently not to paper or? It, it, is, to, it is on paper, but we will document it a little bit more fully and, and share, share that with you. I think, though, uh, as GAO states, we do leave a lot of discretion to the, uh, to the local partnership people, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, a key part of our message are people in the local community know what the challenges are in those local communities, not us here at the Census Bureau headquarters. And we will have partnerships, in a sense, with law enforcement organizations in that sheriffs and police will put out a message that it is safe to fill your form out that is not going to be turned over to local enforcement opportunity. So uh, that is often part of the complete count committee structure that they may bring in uh, you know, some of the local sheriff's department, but it's all in promotional and the whole message there, it's safe to fill out your census form. Okay. Well, if you could share that with us, okay. we, we would certainly appreciate it. And, and obviously, we want, we want to make sure there are some metrics for determining effectiveness. Um, well, I would agree with that. We'll commit yes. to that. Yeah. Um, and, and overall um, criteria for, particip uh, for partnership groups. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Chaffetz, had questions about 
these groups um, and certain groups in particular, uh, a number of my colleagues uh, have had questions about their participation as partners. Um, I know we've asked this question before, but obviously there's a FBI background check for uh, every person you hire, even on a temporary basis. That's correct. And okay. fingerprinting. And does that mean that convicted felons cannot participate? That's true. Okay. Therefore, uh, the question then arises, do you have that same type of criteria for partners and for partner groups in that if they have a history of problems, uh, problems with law enforcement, overall uh, problems like that, that you would be able to say no to them. And we'd no. like to sort of, you don't have that. No, we don't have that criteria. We nor, would, nor do I think it's uh, that the Census Bureau should be involved in investigating uh, organizations and the members of their organizations. That absolutely is, I, I certainly respect you, but what you've just said is absolutely ridiculous. You're giving the, the official stamp of approval that they are a partner for the 2010 census, at which point they, you, they could have a complete uh, reckless uh, uh, disregard for the law and their whole board of directors could be convicted felons, which you would not hire them, but you've been able to give them the stamp of approval that they're a, an official partner. I think it would be reasonable to have a, a certain level of criteria. And I understand the vast number of partners you want to have. I'm not saying anything elaborate. I'm, I'm just saying a basic baseline check that when you uh, basically put your arm around them and say you're our partner, that they're not going to do things that cause problems on Census Day 2010. Uh, before I would agree with I would agree with that assessment. We do not want to partner with groups that will cause problems on Census Day. I was reacting, uh, Congressman, to your question that we somehow should uh, be knowledgeable about all the members of all of these very diverse organizations. And A, we don't have the capability, nor do I think that we should. We should do a scan in terms of um, uh, you know, how this organization is perceived in the local community and whether they can be effective or they'll be ineffective in the local community. I think that's, that's what I'm asking. Okay. Uh, some of my colleagues have specific concerns about specific groups. I have a general concern that we have good partners that are upstanding. And I know it's a Bureau's intent to do that, but I think that's we'd true. like to, I, I think it's the in, intent of Congress for you to have some level of standard uh, for participants. And I, I, I'm not saying that you, you, you have to do an elaborate search on every volunteer that's associated with every group, the T-ball team, you know, the city council or anything else. Heck, it, it, that's not reasonable. But at the same, at the same point, y you need to have some baseline on a background on the, the group. I, I think that is reasonable. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McHenry, uh, and our, our friend from the uh, District of Columbia has joined us, Ms. Norton, and you are recognized for questioning. Well, I, I would thank you, Mr. Chairman, my buddy, uh, for this hearing, but I'm more inclined to say what possessed you to hold such an important hearing on Monday when nobody but Eleanor and a few other souls would be here? This is the most important issue facing the census. <laughs> and uh, I apologize to the witnesses. I had intended to be here the full time I've been speaking around the city. Uh, at least I could have been here. Uh, but I certainly wanted to come to hear what I could. I'm so pleased that the president put a billion dollars in the stimulus package. Uh, to cease the slow walking of the census that almost guaranteed an undercount. Census was starved before it started, and it, 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 it seems to me that those who speak about the Constitution ought to bear in mind that the, the first thing that the framers thought you ought to do is find out who is here. And everybody who came was an immigrant, or virtually everybody, and they were aware that if, if, if government doesn't know who's there, government doesn't know anything. So I was very concerned. I'm chair of a subcommittee uh, that is now hurriedly 
trying to find office space all around the country. And this is very difficult office space to find because this is short-term office space. So I'm hammering uh, the GSA, yeah, it's different, it's different, but these folks need somebody to rent even, even for um, a couple of years. Uh, so we've been, you've been set back in, in many ways. What I was most concerned about is how late lots of things are. This should be a 10-year funding and preparation matter. I'm pleased that the census does update itself. Um, so that in some ways you get a sense of where the country is. I certainly hope that in updating yourselves, you do a better job than what some large cities found. This city, for example, the nation's capital, found uh, new housing bursting out all over, people moving in. We had a $5,000 home buyer credit nobody else in the country had. And the census was continuing to count us losing population. Well, you know, <laughs> there's some things that common sense will tell you uh, is not the case. Uh, when the then mayor, uh, Anthony Williams, pressed the case sufficiently, an updated census was done that showed that the, the nation's capital, in fact, is growing. Uh, it's very, very bothersome, since these are supposed to be statistical experts, and since the updating uh, is supposed to help us count uh, better. I, 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 um, I understand and indeed um, would agree with my good friend from California about the independent status. Indeed, I parted company with those who, who somehow wanted the census in the White House. Uh, watch what you ask for. Uh, the more independent the census is, the better off we are. I'm not sure it would be interesting to trace how it ever got put in a department since uh, this, above all, is a, a, is, is a part of the government which you didn't, do not want people questioning based on their, uh, on their um, uh, political uh, predilections. Um, I have great respect for the professionalism of the civil servants in, in, in the census. That's one of the reasons why I was chagrined when the census had a hard time counting what really are a few people. The district uh, is about 600,000 people. It made me wonder what happened, what would happen if this were New York where I lived uh, for a good part of my life, Washingtonian though I be, and find that where I lived, 140, 41st, 44th in Amsterdam is among those with the dark spots here. Why should I be surprised? But that makes the undercount really the only issue. People who fear to be counted don't, don't uh, aren't used to being counted, aren't as well educated as some other parts of, of the country. And now we have a terrible structural change in our economy. People are having to move in with other people just to survive. I hope that the census is making adjustments for the fact that we don't even uh, if people are having to double up and triple up. Um, I really fear for the undercount of Latinos. It's been a real witch hunt uh, uh, conducted for many years. Uh, that's how let Latinos perceive it, so that we found it was having an effect on people who were perfectly legal. Uh, it's very easy to misread members of Congress who have some power, who seem to go after uh, immigrants, and this uh, cannot possibly uh, help help the census. You've been slow walked to get money. The president's trying to make up for it, um, and you're left with having to um, do a, a real count. Or you're going to hear from a lot of us. <laughs> uh, I've got to ask you about the confusion on race. Now, this morning's Washington Post multiracial pupils to be counted in a new way. And my question really goes to how much the census uh, coordinates with other agencies. There is good reason for um, lo localities to, who, to wanna know something more about people's uh, racial identity, but I wonder if you understand <laughs> what this could produce. Um, the racists who decided that if you had one drop of black blood, you were black, at least did us this favor. <laughs> Unlike those in the Caribbean who then decided to subdivide themselves on how much 
uh, of various ethnic bloods they had in them still suffer from that. If you go to Haiti and virtually every part of the um, Caribbean, you see not only the black-white caste system, you see the black, not quite black, not quite white. You have castes within castes, a terrible, terrible problem. So I know people who said one drop didn't think they were doing us any favor, but uh, in a real sense, they did. Now we are becoming a multiracial country, but whether people know what that means is something the census, if you're being scientific, better watch out for. Uh, during the day, worst days of segregation, one of the most pitiful, pitiful parts of the black community was how many people wanted to, wanted to reach for other kinds of ethnicity that they said were part of theirs. Uh, the Washington Post cites um, Barack Obama as reflecting what we're talking about. Doesn't reflect it at all. Reflects the evolution of a country now led by a president born of a white Kansan mother and a black Kenyan father. The man's black because he's chosen his race. By the way, he didn't have any choice. There are people who would have a choice. Seems to me they ought to be able to choose their race too. But the notion that I'm going to choose any, meeny, miny, mo, and my grandmother always told me that uh, uh, there was this Indian and that white man and this Mexican, so why should not claim them all? I'm proud of all of them. Don't know a one of them. The confusion that is going to have no, no lineage, no understanding, word of mouth. Um, so, it, we, we had these five racial cat categories, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian or Pacific Islander, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, black or non-Hispanic white. Now, in a school system, I might want to know some more information, but I need to know what the census wants to know. Uh, for example, they found that uh, uh, in H H Hispanics, one of the most multiracial people in the world uh, can get very confused and then when they mix in and decide that they will call themselves white then the school system doesn't really know if it's dealing with a, um, a, a person from a family that doesn't speak English or not. So I can understand why the school system may want to, to, to know this. So the education department is saying, hey, look, different strokes for different folks. We're going to give flexibility. The new rules will give states flexibility to use existing racial and ethnic categories with no child left behind, creating a double coding for certain students. I don't, I don't object to that. I just, <laughs> I, 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 but if you do not, if, if we go into um, uh, the notion of, of, of asking people for census purposes, particularly, to uh, ferret out their lineages, I begin to wonder what you will find out. None of us are completely African. We're proud to be called African American. Um, and you can't even tell who we are by looking at us. Who people say they are is the first important thing. There may be subgroups of information that would be helpful, such as uh, what their immediate family, immediate mother and father was, so you have some sense of whether you're talking to, about first generation or not. Um, and I am the first to concede that states need, need different information based on their population. But I need to know what the census is doing and what it says to people as they go and say, you know, claim us, tell us what you are. Uh, and, and of course, you can say anything you want to. That's who you are. I don't think anyone else should be able to describe you, certainly not the way uh, the Southerners decided to describe uh, Africans uh, who were here uh, or people who had very little African blood. 
but I need to know whether you're all mixed up uh, about this as well and how you intend to deal with this. Let it all hang out. Anything that you said you were anywhere back in your lineage, just claim that and we'll know who you are. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, in terms of uh, how we're going to collect data, we're going to collect data on two things. Um, ethnicity, Hispanic, non-Hispanic. So Hispanic is actually not viewed as a race. It's viewed as an ethnicity. So the question will ask for every person, and as you rightfully say, this is self-designation. So it's how people view themselves. So the first question we'll say is, is person one of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? Yes, or well, no, and then yes, they'll ask a little bit about their ancestry, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and so on. So that's the, uh, the question that identifies Hispanic origin. The next question. Could, do you then ask, ask, ask them whether they're black or white? Yes. Then the next question. So that's question eight of the ten questions we're going to ask about every individual. Question nine will say, is persons, uh, what is person one's race? Mark one or more boxes. So they can mark more than one box, but it's white, black, African American, and American Indian or Alaska Native. And then there are breakouts of Asian, uh, Asian Indian. All of these boxes or categories are established by the Office of uh, Management and Budget. And we are following what those guidelines are on race and ethnicity. But it's up to the individual to characterize themselves of Hispanic or non-Hispanic uh, origin. And then there is the race question. And you don't. Um so this is the same categorization you used in the last census? Yeah, this is basically the same characterization. Characterization. There was some research done to better uh, uh, ask some of the components and some of the categories, and we have implemented that. And we'll be doing additional testing in our experimental program in 2010 to refine some of these concepts and definitions. Now, how about the agencies? I was confused as to how the education department, does it collect this data from the, the where they say, you know, let, you have this flexibility? This is, uh, these, uh, the, the race and ethnic categories are established by the Office of Management and Budget, so all federal agencies should be following uh, these So what does this mean? What's this, what's this story in the post mean then? Because according to the story in the post, um, Um, it, it may the be new rules will give states flexibility to use existing racial and ethnic categories for No Child Left Behind, creating a double coding for certain student. Um, a student may be counted as black for some purposes and Hispanics for others. Bless him. <laughs> I, I think that's referring to states. So states and localities. Uh, but this is the new rules from the Department of Education. From sir. education. Okay. Well. I, I, so you don't, uh, they're on their own on that, in other words. Uh, that has, that I, I, really, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're, uh, what they're planning to do. So you don't coordinate what, what agencies do. You speak only for the census, and that's how you count. The, uh, the Office of Management and Budget should be, uh, has oversight responsibilities in terms of what federal agencies are doing. So education should have worked with OMB on the race and ethnicity standards. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Norton. Uh, wow, what a, what a far-reaching, wide breadth of uh, a questioning, uh, consistent with your background as a uh, professor and lecturer, and uh, we appreciate your participation today. Uh, and, and, and as you mentioned earlier, why would we have this on a, a day like this? It's because we knew that key legislators, such as yourself, would be able to be here along with the other people that are here. So thank you so much. Let me let me just wrap up on questionings here and, and ask, uh, you know, the uh, committee has reviewed preliminary plans uh, for spending stimulus money on the communications contract. Mr. Tarkasian, uh, you have 
$10 million at allocated for local buys in the black and Caribbean uh, markets. Yet you have $13 million allocated for the Hispanic and Asian markets. Uh, given the, historic, uh, the, the historical undercounts in the black and Caribbean population, uh, would you expl please explain the disparity in funding allotments? The stimulus money uh, has to be looked at in conjunction with the base plan money that is allocated by audience. Let me ask you to pull that closer to you. There you go. Okay. So if you look at the entire $312 million, um, what we are planning to plan against is $39 million for Hispanic, $36 million for the black audience, and approximately $27 million for the Asian audience. And, and I stress that these are planned at this point in time. We have not put pencil to paper to complete the plans with the addition of the stimulus money as of yet. Uh, once we do that, we will absolutely take a look at how these numbers work and whether we believe and our subcontractors believe that this is the correct allocation, but this is a starting point. Okay, if starting point is fine. I just wanted to make you aware that uh, historically uh, the Asian population has been overcounted, so I was kind of curious as to why we would put direct so many resources to that population. The, the reason for adding resources to the Asian population um, is really from the planning process that we have been through so far, where we've asked all of our subcontractors to come up with a list of what they would do if and when there were additional monies that were available to be spent against their audience. And one of the things that our Asian subcontractor, the IW Group, um, noted was that they wanted to expand from the existing group of languages that they were uh, going to run their campaign in to a broader group. And adding the languages uh, is an expensive proposition um, because these are small populations with very limited um, media outlets. So we have started along that path, as I said. It's planned, it's preliminary. We're gonna take a look at what those plans look like and then come back with a final recommendation. Yeah, be, be sensitive to hard to reach and hard to count. Thank you. And Mr. Messenberg, uh, would the Bureau be willing, we, we've made references to these maps. Uh, let me ask you, would the Bureau be willing to create maps like this uh, for members representing traditionally hard to count constituencies or for all members? Certainly. Uh, in Congress in an effort to better partner with, uh, with the Bureau on reducing. Certainly, Mr. Counts. Chairman. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, I, will, I will ask, let me, let me recognize Mr. McHenry because he wants to finish up too. Sure. Uh, sure. Mr. McHenry, recognize the I'll, question. I'll. I certainly appreciate it. Um, Mr. Messenborg, yes. uh, what do you expect out of the partnership program and what um, and what does the Bureau uh, expect the partners to, you know, the, the role they're supposed to play? Okay. Bottom line, what I expect out of the partnership program is an improved mail response rate, especially in the hard to count uh, areas. Uh, that's really going to be the test of how effective we've been. Um, we're looking for partners to basically cover the landscape in terms of representation and reach in the local communities, and that could involve government. Uh, so we'll certainly be dealing with state, local governments. We'll be working with mayors, both of cities and of towns. Mm -hmm. We'll be dealing with the entire education community both K through 12, which will be the focus of the census in schools, as well as post-secondary. And what do you think the partners expect out of it? Part, part of our message to the partners is um, the census is inclusive. The census, 
census is important. It's going to be used uh, for legislative representation, and it's going to be used for federal fund distribution over $300 billion a year. Most of the partners get that. There is a real stake in counting everyone, that it affects them both from a political perspective as well as the kinds of funding that are going to flow into the local community. Now, there have been a lot of reports about uh, concerns that the faltering economy, the tough economic times we're facing, uh, will make the 2010 census more difficult. Uh, that people are, since people are losing their homes and their jobs, and maybe uh, in the process of moving or, or living with other people, um, and just moving different locations, that it might be f harder to find and enumerate these people. Uh, what are the Bureau's plans uh, to address this concern? I know it's a very new concern, um, but you know, if you could touch on what your plans are and, and perhaps where you are in the planning process. Okay, I'd be glad to. Uh, well, I think the degree of the problem is a new problem. Uh, so we're going, we're, we actually have uh, started doing our address canvassing operation. So that's the first key production activity in the census where we're going to walk every block in the U.S. and validate and update the addresses. So the first, the first critical step is to make sure we have a complete and comprehensive address list. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're rolling out our partnership program. Uh, and as I said, we'll be going from about 680 partnership specialists. We'll be increasing that by 2,000. A key part of that job is to get into the local communities, talk to the people in the communities, and find out uh, the severity of some of these programs. They can help a lot in that, uh, that activity. Uh, then we need to really get trusted voices in the community to, uh, to in inform and educate people that if you are doubling up with somebody, that it's safe to respond and that you should uh, be listed on that census form. So all of this will be part of the messaging, but we think a key part of that is to have those trusted voices in the community making that message. We'll be doing it through advertising and through our own promotional materials, but we really think the local minister uh, can be a lot more effective in convincing is, people. Has this been addressed and added to the integrated communications plan? Yes, this is, this is some of the challenges that we're facing when we look at the clusters of the, of the population. One of the variables is the amount of occupied housing in the area. And as that becomes, uh, as that number decreases, we know we have an additional problem that we need okay. to address. And Mr. Tar Tarkasian, has that been a part of your process in updating the plan? Yes. We have, um, a budget line item in the plan called rapid response. And what that's designed to do is as we start to get mail return in and we see what areas of the country are, or markets are lagging in terms of return, we can then allocate monies uh, to those areas to help bolster return. And, and our plan was to put an additional $2 million of the stimulus funding in the rapid response uh, in, in response to th this issue that you point out. Okay, certainly. Now, uh, Mr. Metzenborg, um, now how many partners, your partners, how many um, employees do you think they'll, they'll help produce for you, uh, temporary workers and enumerators? Well, they're, they're not going to provide really any temporary workers for us. What, what they will provide is a much greater reach in getting the message out to people. So I can give you a couple uh, examples of that. Uh, in the business community, one of the areas that uh, we'll be uh, reaching out to are the utility companies that basically reach everyone in a locality. So one of the things that they've done in the past, and we'll be asking them to do again, is to put messages on their statements, on their envelopes, encouraging everyone that gets one of those utility bills, whether telephone or uh, heating bill and so on, 
to participate in the census. Last time we were very successful with big corporations such as uh, Walmart and Target to actually do promotions in their stores and to uh, you know provide assistance centers if they had the space available. So we'll be doing a whole host of things like that. So it's primarily helping us reach the hard to count and getting the appropriate message out to them. Is there an, any element of the partnership program to help produce enumerators? Uh, what uh, the partners, uh, the partners will, many of them will agree to provide space for recruiting. They actually won't be doing hiring, but they'll donate space and we'll have a Census Bureau employee there taking applications for the jobs. And uh, after we've hired people, uh, they'll be providing sites that we can actually do training on. Okay. Um, now, uh, part of the program to, to hire enumerators for areas that have been traditionally hard to count or higher non-response rate, technically. Um, would, would it be engaging in those community partners uh, to help uh, produce uh, folks in the neighborhood or fo folks in the community to be enumerators? That, that's part of the program? They can assist with the recruiting process. Typically, uh, probably where they will be more useful is going into the local communities as we're starting to hire additional partnership specialists and partnership uh, assistants. Those local communities can, uh, can provide us the names with people that they think are trusted voices in the community and are in the market for the job. Okay. They'll have to go through the interview process and the, and the testing process like everyone else. Now, with the additional folks that you're hiring for the partnership groups, is there a way to verify the efforts and the work that they're doing in the community? Do you have metrics for that? Certainly. Um, well, first, they'll have to go through all of the appropriate clearances to make sure they're okay. Uh, each one of them, as they make commitments, uh, well, they'll have goals in terms of what they're supposed to do, and then they'll enter those commitments in this integrated partnership database, and both the regional staff and headquarters staff will be monitoring uh, that progress. Okay. As a part of the 2010 um, advertising effort and communications, broader communication effort, uh, are there plans for the Bureau to visit editorial boards and newspapers? Certainly. That will be part of our outreach uh, to the media. Okay. Is that your understanding as well, Mr. Tarkasian? Yeah, yes. In fact, our subcontractor, Weber Shanwick, who is a public relations company, is assisting the Bureau in that effort. Okay. Uh, and what's the purpose of these meetings? It, it, it's really to get the, the message of the census out there, uh, make sure that, this, that there's an integrated message, uh, that everybody is on point, and that, uh, you know, it happens at the point in time when it's most beneficial to the communications effort. So it's an overall integrated approach. So it's a message of participation, is that? It, it would it would vary depending upon what the particular medium is, but yes, it would be primarily a participation message. It could be in its early phases an awareness message. Okay, awareness or participation is that correct, Mr. Metzler? Yes, sir, and importance. The important why it's important to participate. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate it. I appreciate the testimony today, Mr. Messenborg. Uh, I know I had some tough direct questions uh, for the beginning because we do want participation and transparency in this process. Uh, but I, I do thank you for your leadership uh, of a very challenging um, and uh, large government program that's very important to all Americans. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCary, uh, Ms. Watson recognized. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, quickly because I do know you have other places you need to be to carry on uh, the focus of the census. Uh, thank you for <coughs> recognizing me. And I want to address this too and follow up with Mrs. Cumberbatch. Uh, I'm looking at this map of New York and I'm kind of appalled. Uh, Tell me what you've been able, the kind of contact you've been able to have. Do you have the resources to do the job? And uh, do you think your position should be a permanent position? 
and can you respond because I'm really concerned about this area here on this map that I think all of you have a copy and the fact that in 2010 we still think there will be an undercount. Um, first let me start off by saying I, I'm an employee of the City of New York so my position is not a federally funded position. It is a decision that has been made by the mayor of the city of New York I that see. this is such an important endeavor that impacts the city that it's important to have someone as a coordinator. My office doesn't have a standing budget, so what I'm doing is getting staff on loan from other city agencies who have connections in different neighborhoods. Let me just ask you this. Can you propose a budget? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. and I think one of one of the things that has to happen is that since my office was created just for the 2010 census, that it needs to be at local levels where there are hard to count communities, a process where perhaps there is a permanent person or small office that starts dealing with these issues in the locality way in advance of the actual census. So for example, one of the communities there is central Brooklyn Bed-Stuy, but someone could have been in place at the local level to start cultivating those relationships far in advance of the census, to start really penetrating. So in, in many respects, it takes a huge effort in a very short period of time to turn around those low response rates. Now, perhaps if resources had been made available much early on, five years ago, six years ago, knowing that there was a low response rate in 2000 and a low response rate in 1990, we would be in a different place in terms of turning around some of those communities. So yes, I think there needs to be a federal commitment at the local level to those areas in terms of staffing, not just for the purpose of the census when it comes up in terms of a partnership program now, because partners are being hired now for a census that's next year, but if people were in place a few years before to start making those relationships and start really penetrating those areas, I think we might be in a different place. Just to follow up, do you think this ought to be a local position within the uh, New York area or should it be a federal position or should they recommend to the local or the regional that we make this a permanent position? I would think a city like New I, York I think it should be a local position within the city government or whatever local governing locality there is in that particular area because at the end of the day the results impact that area most that government agents that government executive most in terms of federal and funding in terms of so there is no input until close to the census in terms of more of an advisory input there's no imp ongoing input into what outreach needs to be needs to happen for that locality to get a higher count and a full and accurate count. Well, you know, New York is the city that's known around the globe. When people come to the United States, they come to New York, and maybe the second stop is to get to my district, Hollywood. But I would think this being the largest population and probably uh, the most well-known place, you should have the best count and the resources, and they need to be appropriated, as you're saying, long before we get to the actual taking of the census. And so I'm hoping that you're conveying this in a proposal to the Census Bureau so you can get the proper resources so this famous and uh, well-known city around this globe will have the proper governmental support in programs will have the proper count in terms of positions in this government and uh, the proper resources to make it effective. So I would hope that you would present a proposal Definitely. Uh, to the Census Bureau. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I know that we're way over time. Thank you, Ms. Watson, for the questioning. And uh, Ms. Norton, we are going to let you have the final say. You say we're over time. I'm sure there's no place that the chairman has to be that's more important than chairing this. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> <laughs> what would I do without the chairman, the kid? But I did want to ask this uh, last question. I looked at uh, page, uh, Mr. Mes Messenburg, I looked at page three of your testimony, and I've tried to do some fast arithmetic. 
I don't know how to judge the total and uh, the original contract, as you say, uh, of $212 million. So I don't have any basis to judge that figure. But with set, uh, 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 the reason I look at it is because to the chagrin, I hope, of all of us, uh, the written word is out of fashion. So more people know about DC voting rights from having seen me on the Colbert Report than having read or any scholarly thing that might have been uttered from my mouth. Uh, so we, I think we have to assume that educated and not, people uh, rely on the media for news, very dangerous, but that's the way it is. Um, indeed, uh, we, you know, when, when the language has now been reduced to Twitters, um, you better be working on one. Um, but okay, so I looked at where I think most people get whatever information they get. So I have no judgment to make of 212 minutes. It looks slight to me, but who am I? Since uh, this is the original communications contract, the whole contract. So that's print and other media. What's your whole budget, sir? Well, actually, the two the two hundred and twelve mil million was the original contact uh, contract. Thanks to the stimulus, it's now three hundred and twelve million. So wow! Quite, but so I, again, I don't know how to judge that either. So I'll just go on to hard to reach. If if it's hard to reach people who graduated from college with information, I'm assuming it'll be even harder to reach the hard to reach. Uh, one hundred and seventy is directed to paid advertising. So I looked at that figure, so that means 42 goes off the top to somebody because it's not directed to the content. Um, then, um, then if you continue to, to count, you get to 52, uh, uh, the mass communications component to reach all persons who consume media in English regardless of race or ethnicity. So that, uh, that, I don't even know what that means because we, again, much to my chagrin, live in tribes. <laughs> you know, people communicate through Hispanic stations. Uh, they, they black and they speak only English, but they don't listen to anything except black stations. Too bad, but again, I'm giving you the way I, I believe it is. So, okay, for all of these people, and, 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 and this leaves the impression that it's across the board, so it doesn't, it says all of those, regardless of race or ethnicity. So it, it would mean that if you listen to an all news station, or maybe this isn't what you mean, um, regardless of race or ethnicity, as opposed to breaking that down further. Then it says two, 52 million, so we start with 212 million and 52 million is of the total is planned for media buys. What in the world are you doing with the rest of the money? Um, um, the way I, I counted, you start with 91 for direct media buys um, and that looks like it's print as well as um, uh, forms of media that people actually use to get information, uh, regretfully. Um, then 52 million is for direct media buys. Um, and I, I, I simply have to ask you, uh, how one justify the total figure for reaching the hard to reach? And two, where will these media buys occur in order to reach people where they listen to information? Or read information? Okay. Uh, I apologize, I think my written testimony contributed to the confusion, so maybe I can take a moment to try to uh, to clarify. Thank you. So the $312 million is the total uh, the total contract, 250. Now, out of a total budget of? Out of uh, the entire life cycles between 14 and 15 billion dollars. So how did that, you arrive at 312 million uh, uh, since 
out of a 14 or 15 billion dollar budget for media buys? Uh, the 14 to 15 billions across the 10 year life cycle of the census. So in 2009, we had a budget of about two, 2.7 billion, and uh, we're going to be getting an additional 4 billion in 2010, and of course we have the stimulus funding. So in terms of context, we think this is what we need uh, to do the advertising. In inflated terms, this is a greater budget than we had in the 2000 What census. was the budget in the 2000 census? Uh, 262. So we're at 312 right now. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, and so of the 312, 258 million will be spent on uh, paid media that includes production, labor, and so on. And then when of you the get three twelve of the three twelve, two hundred and fifty eight million is directed towards paid media, and that includes production and labor in terms of creating the content. So in terms of our actual advertising buys, it's one hundred and forty five million dollars, and sixty two, sixty three million. These are preliminary estimates will be directed towards the national market. The national market, what, what I meant to explain there is if you consume um, media in English, then the national campaign will reach you. Well, how is that broken down? It's going to, the national campaign is going to be uh, national, so it's aimed at people that consume their media in English, regardless of their race or their ethnicity. The uh, uh, local, uh, uh, the Mr. local Mr. component. Mr. Met, uh, uh, okay. So you mean there's a national and a local? Yes. And the local is about uh, $83 million. And that's aimed at, ra at uh, reaching uh, ethnic local audiences in the right media, uh, whether TV, radio, print, newspapers, magazines, but it's going to be very targeted. Uh, could I ask you to get to the chairman of this subcommittee a uh, breakdown uh, in, in as, 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 as finely as you can of how that media by, I, I opine on something I don't know, but I do believe that the best way to reach the hall, to, to disabuse people that the government is coming after you when the Census Bureau comes is to have a friendly voice, not from the Census, if I may say so, some friendly community voice that speaks the language or speaks the, the, the logo and can speak credibly with the community. Now, I, I, I regret this. But these communities are divided and listen. This is one, this is maybe the decline and fall of America. <laughs> when you have everybody 